really, really excited to have Rob Dickinson here. I think it's going to be a great presentation and just a little bit about him. Uh, he's a research hydrologist and the branch chief uh, with the USGS at the Columbia Environmental Research Center in Columbia, uh, Missouri. He received, received his PhD from the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University, and he holds an undergraduate degree in geology from Carleton College. So very much somebody from our area. Uh, he has worked with the, the geological uh, geo uh, USGS for the last 25 years in geologic hazards, neotectonics, paleoseismology, geomorphology, official processes, and riverine habitat dynamics. Um, he serve, uh, supervises a staff of geomorphologists and hydrologists that are engaged in interdisciplinary research in fundamental processes and uh, places an emphasis on relating quantitative understanding of fundamental fluid processes to the practice of river rehabilitation. So with that, Rob, please come on up. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, update to my bio. It's actually 32 years now with USGS instead of 25. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Good. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, meeting so far. This talk is going to be about something a little bit different, so it's meant to be a little bit entertaining to you guys. It's about the uh, experience of, of uh, restoration on large rivers. I'm going to use the Missouri River as an example. Um, so the objectives of the talk i would explore the context of quote unquote restoration uh, of a large river. I'm going to use the Missouri River Recovery Program as, as a vehicle for doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I will emphasize the importance of understanding the river. That's sort of everything. Everybody knows that. You need to understand the river you're working in. Um, but I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on the institutional context. That is, in, in multi-objective river systems, big rivers, uh, where there's a lot of different people getting a lot of different goods and services mm -hmm. out of the river, Restoration is just one of those things that's going on, one of the objectives, and it's often in conflict with uh, some of the other uh, goods and services, or at least the perception of those values that are coming from the river system. And as a result, there's a high expectation for science. That's really my, my take home message, is that uh, when there's a perception that uh, restoration has a downside to it, the expectation that the science is going to be able to justify that restoration is, is much higher. Um, so, large river restoration is contentious, uh, it's challenging, it's complex, uh, and in cases it appears irrational. I'll just remind you, I'm just the messenger here. Um, I, don't, I don't condone irrational uh, behaviors, um, and it's obviously not natural channel design. So, some definitions to start with. These are all the, the R words, and then, and then I've got naturalization in there as well. Now, for this group, you know, many of you have had this conversation with, with your stakeholders. What do we really mean by restoration? That becomes very, very important on, on large rivers where there's perceived trade-offs between restoration activities and, and other uh, goods and services. Um, so I'm using restoration very loosely here. I'm not using it in the formal definition that the NRC recommended, which is recovery of the structure and function of the, of the ecosystem. Really what we're talking about on large rivers is something more like rehabilitation as it was uh, defined here, pragmatic recovery of some of the ecosystem structure and function. Uh, reclamation has elements of that too. It's actually increasing the biophysical or some parts of the biophysical capacity of the system beyond what might be natural. One of the terms I like the best is uh, naturalization as it was uh, defined by Bruce Rhodes and his colleagues in 1999 in this article because they make it explicit that what's happening is partly a social construct. It's what the stakeholders want the system to look like. So it has that element of sort of a designer ecosystem. But in the Missouri River, we actually use the word recovery instead of any of the rest of these. And that's partly because we're avoiding any of the other definitions. It's, uh, it's not well defined, but it does allude to recovery under the Endangered Species Act. Um, next question I want to get to is what is a large river? What do I really mean by that? And there's a variety of different definitions. One of my favorite ones is the operational definition uh, where you, know, you have weightable streams and non-weightable streams. Large rivers, from my uh, definition, are ones where you never need to get out of the boat unless it's time to have a picnic. Um, so this is, this is good in some ways. In large rivers, uh, we, can, we can use uh, GPS, we can use 
uh, hydroacoustics. I work in large turbid rivers, so we do a lot of stuff with, with hydroacoustics. Uh, we have uh, you know, current uh, acoustic Doppler current profilers. We can uh, classify the bed materials. We can do a lot of stuff in an automated fashion because it's a large river. We're working from these instrumented uh, boat platforms. There are challenges on the biological side, however, especially for fish sampling. The traditional fish sampling, which gets at that biological endpoint, a lot of restoration is very difficult in large rivers. There are some things that are done with telemetry and hydroacoustics with fish, which provide some um, optimism for the future. But uh, as far as the physical side of what we measure, these, uh, these systems have some, uh, some benefits. Um, so large rivers are characterized by you know, length, width, depth, uh, discharge, drainage area. So we can kind of think about what the criteria are for that. Some biological characteristics of large rivers is they tend to be um, uh, corridors for movement of some species that migrate large distances, you know, fish, birds, mammals. Um, probably the, you know, the most important characteristics of large rivers are the socioeconomic characteristics because they're used by so many people for, for different things. They're intensively managed, used for hydropower, navigation, uh, floodplain agriculture, uh, urban areas, uh, water supply, wastewater disposal. And restoration is competing with, the, with uh, those uses of large rivers and, and their floodplains. So there's many values, many institutions and entities at the table uh, for decision making. Um, we have a, a project going on in the Midwest of the uh, USGS right now that's uh, called the Large River Initiative. And as part of that, we're deciding what rivers do we consider to be large. And so these are the ones that we look at in the, in the uh, Midwest United States we consider to be uh, of this large river category. And I'm going to be talking about the Missouri, which enters the Mississippi down here and goes all the way up to Three Forks, Montana. Um, <clears throat> this is everything I know about how rivers work. And I could, I could just stop the talk right now and ask questions and go for questions. But um, uh, this is from a paper that I wrote with uh, Jim Berkeley from the EPA a couple years ago that's about conceptualizing how rivers work. And it is complicated, but I want to just draw you through this to make a couple of different points. What this is, if you look at it more broadly, is that there's, uh, there's the governance and decision making over here. There's socioeconomic drivers that determine what that decision making and governance looks like. There's natural system over here, fluxes and regimes of sediment, light, temperature, etc. There's a history of changes to the river system. Then there's some management action, restoration or management action, and it propagates through the ecosystem. Then there's some performance measures, and you can see that this is an adaptive management loop here. So that's what it's meant to portray. But I want to go into a little bit more detail into that ecosystem part to make just a couple of, of points. We characterize the ecosystem in these boxes we call essential ecosystem characteristics, an idea that was originally uh, used for conceptual ecological modeling in uh, the Everglades. It was adopted on the upper Mississippi, and then we use it on the, on the Missouri River and on the, the Platte River as well. Um, and essentially, there are those components that we kind of get our arms around about what, what uh, suite of processes or conditions we think uh, is important. So we have these tiers of essential ecosystem characteristics, tier one, tier two, one, tier two, to three. Up here we have hydrology, channel morphology, center of transport, biogeochemistry, essentially the independent variables. Um, these things are all related in complex ways, but a lot of stuff, this gets combined to create habitat, habitat availability in space and time, and then habitat uh, propagates down to some sort of biotic result. Uh, this is the uh, natural side of, of this diagram. There's also the socioeconomic side. So we see a parallel thing over here, the social economic benefits of the system and the social economic values uh, uh, at the bottom. This has turned out to be a useful tool for us to discuss strategies for restoration planning on large rivers. Um, uh, there are also some things that go back and forth here. We might call those ecosystem services. Um, but here's one of the points that I, I'd like to make as you go down through this, through this hierarchy. You know, a lot of the restoration activities actually take place up here, but then they propagate down through habitat and biota. As you go from the upper part to the lower part, you have increasing cost in design, increasing cost in uh, monitoring and assessment and in modeling. You have increasing uncertainty because you're going through the habitat boxes down to the biotic boxes, but you also have increasing relevance. That is, most of the time, uh, when restoration is taking place, especially on large rivers, it's about restoration for a biotic end result, and there's increasing uncertainty when we get there. Another relevant thing about this, this diagram that I, I find useful is that in a lot of the decision-making that takes place, there's an explicit trade-off 
between the restoration activities on the right-hand side and the socioeconomic activities on the left-hand side. And that trade-off takes place, and they're trying to determine, you know, if we do this for restoration, we think this is going to happen to biota, what's going to cost and what's it going to do, what's, what's going to be the diminished effect on some of the socioeconomic values. The problem is that the things on the left-hand side over here can be very precisely enumerated, usually in terms of dollars, whereas on the right-hand side here, it's pretty fuzzy. Uh, we'd like to get it more um, detailed and precise, but a lot of times it's, it's pretty fuzzy. Um, so one other thing here is that you know, we have indirect measures or metrics that go into these different boxes. Uh, and uh, so if we're looking at how to measure or predict success, we can do it up here. Uh, in terms of channel dimension, maybe environmental flow components, uh, or down here in terms of habitat, way to usable area, some sort of habitat, or down here in terms of population metrics, uh, age, growth, uh, things like that, survival. Um, and a lot of times, restoration will, will look just up at this. This is like the uh, natural flow regime. Basically, the tenet of the natural flow regime is on, on these highly managed rivers, if you put the hydrology back, everything else will follow and you don't have to worry about it. You can infer success from that. Um, and then some people wouldn't take that for granted and say, well, you have to demonstrate here at this habitat level that this is, that this is working. Um, this is more of the, uh, the field of dreams idea. Build it and they will come, okay? So now we're, now we're done. But then other people say, no, that's not enough. We need to know if you're actually gonna have this biological result down here. Mm -hmm. And that's the box that we find ourselves in in these uh, large river projects. So there's all the concept. Now I'm going to talk more about the, the river itself to give you an idea of what's happened to it and what the prospects are. So there's, there's the Missouri River Basin. It's a very large basin. Uh, it's the longest river in, uh, in the United States. It covers a lot of North America. Uh, and even though it's large, it's not isolated. So, of course, restoration activities, management activities on the Missouri River actually affect Gulf hypoxia. Uh, they affect the world economy with, with export of, uh, of agricultural materials. There's connections of the hydropower system uh, in, uh, in the Missouri River Basin with the, uh, with the uh, power network throughout North America. And there's increasing calls for water from the Missouri River to be piped across the divides into places like, uh, like Southern California. So even though it's a large basin, there are decisions that are made in uh, Missouri that are affected by other things outside the basin. Um, it's got parts of 10 states in it, two countries, a little bit of uh, Canada up there, 28 Na Native American tribes, most of which have not adjudicated their water rights. They have senior water rights. We have a very large metropolitan area down here that has a very, very high water demand. Uh, but other than that, the actual density, there's only 10 million people in the basin, so it's not a really dense sort of place. And when it gets stacked up against uh, the Sacramento, San Joaquin, or the Everglades, it doesn't have quite the, uh, the congressional push that some of those areas have. Um, this is the uh, precipitation in the Missouri River Basin. The Missouri River, you know, and for those of us in this part of the country, we think of it as sort of a big, humid river because we're down here uh, in, in this part of the country. But in fact, it's dominated by semi-arid Great Plains and snowmelt in the uh, Rocky Mountains. It's quintessentially a western river and has all the water problems, water fights of, of western rivers. Uh, quote attributed to Mark Twain, whiskeys for drinking, waters for fighting over. Uh, any decisions that are made about water allocations on the Missouri River are contentious and are fought over um, and will continue to be fought over. The water resources in the, in the basin have been uh, um, highly altered by exploitation by the Bureau of Reclamation and the uh, Corps of Engineers. I'm going to be concentrating mainly on the Corps of Engineers system of, of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six main stem dams from Fort Peck down here to Lewis and Clark Lake behind Gavin's Point Dam. Uh, those six uh, dams have 91 cubic kilometers of storage, it's the largest storage system in North America. In an average year, it generates 10 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, which is worth a lot of money. It's about one and a half nuclear power plants. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other dams in the system as well. Um, but that's had a big effect on water. We put a lot of emphasis on water in a system like this um, when it comes to restoration because of the you know, the natural, well, the dominant paradigm in, in, uh, in uh, river restoration, aquatic ecosystem restoration, is that you have to get the hydrology right. So the hydrology has been highly, highly altered. This is, uh, these are some diagrams I'm going to show that are <coughs> hydrographs, a way to show the hydrographs on the river. Uh, comparison of 100 years of daily data 
So this shows the seasonal variation here on the, on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, discharge in uh, thousands of cubic feet per second. Um, and the bands are the interquartile range. Uh, so this is 75% uh, flow exceeds and 25% flow exceeds. And gray is the natural hydrograph, and then blue kind of overprinted on that is a regulated hydrograph. So this is what it looks like when the water comes out of uh, Fort Peck Dam up here in uh, uh, Wolf Point, Montana. And you can see the dam does what it's supposed to do. It takes the peaks off, off the hydrograph. And then it often has higher releases in, in the fall when that dam has to evacuate for flood control. So it's a highly altered hydrograph there. Interestingly, a little bit downstream in Williston, North Dakota, the hydrograph recovers to a very good looking semblance of the natural hydrograph. And that's because this is just downstream of the Yellowstone River, uh, which is our reference condition for the least altered hydrology uh, in North America. So there's a section of the upper Missouri River from the confluence either 20 to 40 or 60 miles downstream, depending on lake level and Lake Skakawea, where there's a really nice looking hydrograph and, and thought to be a very functional hydrograph. But it doesn't last very long. So downstream from a garrison dam at Bismarck, again, we have a highly altered hydrograph. The natural hydrograph is now starting to show these characteristic two peaks, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the first one is from snow melt on the plains, and then this is Rocky Mountain <coughs> snow melt. Um, look down here at Sioux City, we see a highly, highly altered hydrograph. Um, the, you can see the two peaks here, and then blue is the, the, uh, the current water control plan. Uh, and in this case, the, the peaks have been taken off, but we also see a very uh, constant flow held from uh, April 1st through uh, the end of November. That's to maintain navigation. There's um, uh, towboat navigation for 735 miles of the Missouri River from Sioux City down to St. Louis, and part of that is, is maintained by channelization, part of that is maintained by flows out of the dam. And then as we move downstream, some of those unmanaged uh, tributaries come in and they restore a little bit of, of that variability. So this is one of those geography things. There's a lot of alteration along the river, but the degree of alteration differs in, in different places. And so some of the restoration questions revolve around where are the places that really need to be restored or where are the places where it's easiest to restore and what are those restoration objectives. And keeping that, that geography in mind uh, is important. Another geographic thing is, is this. I've highlighted here the precipitation uh, in the base of between 200 and 500 millimeters a year. All other things being equal, this is the range of precipitation that creates the highest sediment yield. So the Missouri River Basin is dominated by that and has always been a sediment producing monster. These are arteriograms in a, um, a USGS publication by Bob Mead on water quality in the Mississippi River Basin, where it, the, the width of the uh, river system is proportional to, in this case, the sediment load. And so he shows the uh, circa 1700 pre, uh, uh, pre-engineered condition and then the post-engineered condition here. And so you can see that the Missouri River has always been the dominant source of sediment in the Mississippi River Basin, eventually getting down to feed barrier islands uh, and uh, swamps uh, down in the, uh, the Louisiana Delta. <clears throat> and that has been cut off uh, very strongly by the dams that are, that are in the system. And so now we calculate that the present day sediment load is about 17% of what it was. This is a huge constraint on restoration um, uh, in the Missouri River Basin. We can do a lot with the water through the dam system. The dams were, uh, the main stem dams in the Missouri River were constructed Designed in the 40s, constructed in the 50s and the 60s, and they were not designed to pass sediment. So they weren't using you know, modern <coughs> ideas of, of, uh, of uh, sediment transport. So the result is there's some places along the river where there's too much sediment. People are very upset about that. There's deltas uh, in all of the, the lakes. And then downstream, there's sediment deficits. And this becomes a problem, especially this is Gavin's Point Dam. And this section of the river down for the next uh, 50 miles is important um, nesting habitat for interior lease turns and piping plovers. They require sandbars in a system that no longer has the sand um, delivered to it that it used to. Um, another implication uh, about uh, this, this um, um, sediment transport deficit is the channel adjustment. This is a longitudinal plot. I do this from upstream to downstream, left to right. So. 811 miles upstream is Gavin's Point Dam on the Lower Missouri River, and zero is down here at the Mississippi River. The blue line is cumulative uh, drainage area of the tributaries that are coming in. The uh, green line 
is change in a, an imaginary plane that the Corps of Engineers uses uh, for their construction. It's called the construction reference plane. It's nominally 75% flow exceedance during the navigation season. Um, and this is 15 years of change in that elevation change. And it's indicative of what's been going on in the system. There's no sediment coming through the dam. And so over 15 years, there's been an, over a meter of channel incision in that area. Um, coming down to this area, it's downstream of the Platte River. The Platte River brings in a lot of sediment. Um, now it doesn't you know, compensate for what's behind the dam. It brings a lot of sediment, not a whole lot of water. And there's actually channel aggradation going on here. Then very deep channel incision. This is right in Kansas City. Part of this is because sand is taken out of, the, out of the river commercially, and then some variable incision downstream. This is context for restoration, too, because, and this is an ongoing process, very hard to connect a floodplain in this area. It's actually too easy to connect the floodplain here. This is where the stakeholders, especially the agricultural community, is extremely concerned about any changes to the river system that exacerbate flooding problems in this area. And again, very hard to do much restoration in this area where there's so much uh, channel incision taking place. So there's, a, there's an, over, an overprint of, uh, of this channel adjustment that also affects restoration potential. And finally, get into some of the uh, channelization stuff. Missouri River used to be extremely wild. This is from uh, 1833, a sort of famous uh, watercolor was done by Carl Bodmer, showing why so many steamboats sank on the Missouri River, just chock full of large woody debris snags. Well, those are taken out, and then over the years, the, the river was channelized for, for navigation. If you've ever seen a talk on the Missouri River, you always see this set of slides. It shows the progressive um, uh, trapping of sediment using uh, pile dikes and, uh, and willow wattles, uh, narrowing of, of the channel, what was a very dynamic, uh, very shallow, very diverse, uh, braided to anastomosing river channel into a single thread meandering channel. Uh, stabilization of the banks followed. This accreted land turns out to be extremely productive farmland, extremely valued farmland. Uh, and uh, then levees went up uh, to protect that farmland from, uh, from flooding. So now some of the dominant habitat features on the river are rock that the Corps of Engineers has put in. Uh, the river, uh, every single outside bend is revetted. Inside bends have a series of wing dikes, L heads, and spur dikes in them. And they have a lot of uh, hydraulic diversity associated with them. Uh, another example of showing what this looked like is 1894 map in Herman, Missouri, and the lower Missouri River, showing the anastomosing channels, the uh, numerous sandbars, and this is what the channel is. Oh, this is what the channel is like today. It's about a third of the top width, and it's completely held in place. You okay? Yeah? Is everything okay? Good. The table collapsed. <laughs> so I thought that was just a reaction to this. But <laughs> oh my God, that's narrow. Uh, so the, 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 the channel itself has been been highly, highly altered. This is a really altered river system. And those are the things, the, the water and the channel morphology, the things the Corps of Engineers is responsible for. But the river is also in this agricultural landscape, and we've got you know, major municipalities along it as well. So there are water quality issues on the Missouri River. It's not thought that those are major issues right now, but it's something to keep in mind. So habitat alteration on the river. The bank stabilization and navigation project altogether decreased the amount of aquatic habitat by 404 square kilometers. What they have here is terrestrial habitat is actually sandbar habitat decreased by 274 square kilometers. And then what used to be connected floodplain in the meander belt, over 1,400 square kilometers of that has been reduced. So some of the restoration strategy has been to put some of this back. The biological impact of those changes to the system can be inferred, but there's no good cause and effect sort of argument. This is one of the few temporal data sets. This is on catfish harvest, uh, showing the uh, decline in harvest, especially here when the dams closed. And so the inference is the dams were closed, changed the hydrology, and catfish harvest went down. A lot of other things going on at the same time, but that's been the inference. The uh, fish population is, has been, it is thought, has been highly impacted by these changes in the system. There are 24 native fishes in decline, five are globally imperiled. 11 that are listed by the states, and then there's one that's federally endangered, which is one I'm going to talk about in, in some detail. Um, 
all of that change to the system though has quite a bit of economic value. This is a economic protocol called the National Economic Development Protocol. It's just one way of putting the numbers together. It's what the Corps of Engineers uses. Um, and this is how they attribute annual benefits of the system. Hydropower, almost a billion dollars a year. Water supply, eight, about $757 million a year. Flood control, 581. Uh, recreation and navigation. So total annual benefit to the system, and this protocol really underestimates what you know, actual benefits are, but the number that's, that's used is, is this one here, about $2.4 billion a year in benefits from these dams and from the, from the uh, navigation channel. Um, there's been a lot of work then put into restoring it. So this is the numbers, this is what I cited in the, in the abstract, some of the numbers in restoration. Um, so starting in the 1990s up to the present, um, the annual budgets recently have been in the, the 50, I think in 2015 we're looking at $55 million. Uh, but you know, about $700 million have been spent on quote unquote restoration activities over the last, last 10 years. Some of these are quite inventive. Uh, this, one, uh, this one here, which are, are these donuts, uh, sort of anti-natural channel design. Um, and I have to tell you, these did not last very long. Uh, they were sort of a, there, there's a whole legal story about that that I won't, I won't get into. Um, when, when this restoration started to take place, so the bank stabilization navigation process finished in 1981. They started in the 30s and finished in 1981. And immediately they said, you guys have really screwed up the river. And therefore, the Water Resources Development Act of 1986 had the Missouri River Bank Stabilization Navigation Project Fish and Wildlife Mitigation Program authorized in it. So in 1986, they started to say, okay, let's try to do some restoration with this. And then that was reauthorized and expanded in the Water Resources Development Act in 1999 with the idea of replacing 32% of that lost habitat. And it was both terrestrial habitat, connected floodplain, and aquatic habitat. So they took a pretty holistic view of things. So when they started out restoring the river, it was like a holistic restoration objective. In the 1990s, uh, three species were listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And then in 2000, 2003, there were biological opinions written by the, by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to enforce the Endangered Species Act on the Missouri River. And um, they have uh, reasonable and prudent alternatives for the three species. It was a jeopardy opinion for the Pallas sturgeon. The Fish and Wildlife Service told the Corps things they had to do specifically to recover these species. What that did is it took a lot of the impetus and motivation for restoration away from holistic restoration, ecological restoration, into particular species restoration. And so the Corps, ha uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service had specific types of habitat that they told the Corps they had to, uh, they had to um, uh, restore in order to uh, promote these species. And that was followed up in 2011 by guidance that went forward from the Corps of Engineers throughout the country, basically addressing the question about money that's being spent under the Endangered Species Act for ecological restoration that is beyond what the Corps is legally required to do. Um, Ensure that the Civil Works budget is not inappropriately diverted to pay for large-scale environmental restoration projects that Congress has not authorized or funded in the guise of alleged Endangered Species Act responsibilities that are not legitimately the core responsibilities under the Endangered Species Act. This had really important guidance to, uh, to the stakeholders on the Missouri River Basin saying, this is not holistic, it's about three species, only three species. Uh, all the restoration has to be about that. Now, it turned out the Water Resources Development Act of 2007 authorized a study for ecological restoration on the Missouri River, a more holistic uh, uh, restoration authority that might come sometime in the future. That study was defunded, though, in 2012 by the downstream states and has been defunded every, every year since then. So everything is really on these three listed species. Interior lease turn, which might be up for delisting. I'll explain that in a minute. Piping plover, which is threatened. They both uh, nest on bare sandbars. And the pallid sturgeon, which is the one to the, um, which is the one to the right here. This is a shovel nose sturgeon. That's a pallid sturgeon. So I'm going to go through the, some of the biology of these species um, uh, pretty quickly. This is a map of nesting sites of the interior lease turn throughout the central, central flyway. 
And in the Missouri River, we're specifically interested in these nesting sites downstream from Gavin's Point Dam, some of the nesting sites on the reservoirs, and some on the upper Missouri River here. Most of the emphasis, because most of the productivity, is on these nesting sites right here downstream from Gavin's Point Dam. But what this map brings up is that there's a recovery program on the Missouri River, because there's a biological opinion on the Missouri River, to recover this species. But recovery of the species also depends on what happens in all these other areas. So it's not isolated from that. And in fact, one of the reasons the interior lease turn is up for delisting is that there's a huge number of turn colonies down here on the lower Mississippi River that nest on sandbars that are associated with large wing guy complexes on the Mississippi River. So there's some complications there that have to do with the fact that these birds do move around. The birds are much easier than the fish in a variety of ways, but it's most specifically this. You can observe success with birds. Birds nest on sandbars. We can measure sandbars. We know something about how sandbars are formed and how they erode. We can count nests. We can count the number of eggs per nest. We can figure out if those eggs have hatched and whether the birds have flown off successfully. So we can connect explicitly habitat, that restoration thing we're doing, sandbars, with population dynamics. And that's a very, very um, uh, important and powerful thing we can't do with, with, with the, uh, the fish. This is where it all comes in. This is, this is a population demographic rate. This is the uh, reproduction potential, number of fledglings per pair of, uh, of uh, piping plovers, and this is density. There's a density dependence here. The lower the density, the higher the, the productivity. That is a critical relationship that's very useful in the planning and restoration of, uh, of sandbars for interior uh, lease turns and piping plovers. So, Missouri River creates a lot of sandbars in a few areas. They dredge sand up, they move it around on, on these bars to create these complexes. Once they're created, they uh, work very hard to keep them from becoming vegetated. <coughs> At one time, there was actually a cottonwood restoration program in the Missouri River, and then there was also a sandbar restoration pro program in the Missouri River with completely opposite restoration objectives. <laughs> the cottonwood went away because the, that was actually to support bald eagle, and the bald eagle was delisted. So the cottonwood restoration went away, and so now it's all about keeping the vegetation, keeping the cottonwoods out of the, uh, off of the bars, either by mechanical changes or by spraying of herbicides. Here's an example, just, I'm not going to talk a lot about, the, about the, uh, the birds, but here's just an example of one of, one of these projects. This is near Ponca State Park uh, uh, in, uh, in Nebraska, and uh, this is what it looked like in 2003. So uh, this is a backwater complex that they put in there, not for pallid sturgeon habitat, because pallid sturgeon don't use backwaters, but for other native fish species. And they took the dredge material from that and they created these sandbars to create turn and plover nesting habitat. Uh, and those stuck around for a little bit, but by 2009 they were essentially gone. Um, and, and we also had the flood of 2011 to put a lot of those sandbars back naturally. Um, but um, there's, um, this is, so here's sort of like the state of the art for, for the bird management. There's a, there's a clear, you know, clear understanding of the relationship between sandbars and bird productivity. So more sandbars, more birds, it's pretty straightforward. There are these geomorphic uncertainties about what it takes to create a sandbar, how long they stick around, what sustainability means, what the costs are involved with that. Um, and there are, like I point out, there's some of these biological uncertainties dealing with uh, where the birds come from and, and how they overwinter, et cetera. But generally, it's a much easier system with the birds that uh, this is what it takes to create habitat for them. The situation with the fish is different. The fish lives at the bottom of a big muddy river. On the left here, this is the um, historical range of the pallid sturgeon all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to uh, uh, Three Forks, Montana. This is what the range looks like today. Uh, we're concerned with Missouri River up here. It's been highly fragmented by these dams. Right now, there's 125 wild adults uh, in the upper river system. Uh, they're all 40 to 50 years old. They're not reproducing. There's been zero recruitment. That is zero uh, um, documentation of fish reproducing in the wild to age one. Um, from Gavin's Point Dam down to the Mississippi River down here, we have zero or nearly zero recruitment. We have probably a larger population of fish, but one of the things that we don't know, the biological uncertainty, is exactly how many fish are there because it's so difficult to count them in, in this kind of river system. So a little bit about the biology of this fish species. The fish uses a lot of the river. A reproductive uh, uh, fish 
will migrate hundreds of kilometers upstream. We've documented 400, 600, 800 kilometers of upstream migration of these fish. They find highly turbid areas over hard substrate to spawn. Uh, they have uh, adhesive eggs that uh, will need to be fertilized and they adhere to the, to the substrate. And then they incubate for four to seven days during which there has to be some sort of stability. They hatch and then the free embryos uh, can drift for as many as 14 days after that downstream. Drifting pretty much passively with the current, do the math, uh, 14 days at about 60 to 80 miles a day, that means that there's hundreds of kilometers downstream that these, that these fish move. So the restoration objective on this river system isn't a piece of the river. It's not like one slough where those Topeka shiners were yesterday. It's hundreds of kilometers of the river that have to be accommodated in the restoration strategy. Um, so another thing about the, uh, about the fish species is that um, one of the things we know pretty well is that survival, by the time they're uh, two years old to when they're 30, 40, 50 years old, their annual survival rate is about 99.3%. So when they get to be this big, they stick around. Conversely, this part of their life cycle, their survival is either zero or .0001. So this is the critical part of their life cycle, and that's the part that the restoration activity has to address. So let me tell you a little bit about, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the, the detail about what we actually do in science in the river, but one of the things we're pretty proud of is we've developed um, remote sensing tools and telemetry tools so we can really characterize the habitat these fish are in very well. So here's a multi-beam map of the uh, confluence of the Osage River and Missouri River. And each one of these dots here is a fish location. So we can put these fish on the map, we can see what habitats they select, we can infer what they need as long as they're adults. Because they have to be big in order to put those transmitters in them. But we know a lot about what the adults are doing. Unfortunately, that's at 99% survival. The critical issue are these guys. And you can imagine what it's like. We can't put transmitters in them. Uh, they're extremely difficult to, the, to, to capture. The statistics are daunting in a, in a deep, muddy river. And essentially, they're unobservable. This is the environment that they live in. I'm kind of proud of that effect, by the way. <laughs> but it, I mean, when you think about the parallel between what we're doing with the palace jurgeon and, say, the salmon, you can see what salmon do. You can't see what palace jurgeon do. And that's, that's the issue. So uh, a little bit more geography and about the recovery of the, uh, the palace sturgeon. So it's a very different situation on the upper river here at the confluence of the Yellowstone and the upper Missouri compared to the lower river. Uh, the issue up here is that the dominant hypothesis is that if the fish, those free embryos, drift into Lake Sakakawea, they will die either through predation or anoxia. Um, and there are impediments to passage for the adults. So we've got Fort Peck Dam here. There's, sometimes the fish we think may have gone up the Milk River, but there's another dam up there at Vandalia. And there's a weir here on the Yellowstone. The fish can choose whether to go up the Yellowstone or go up the Missouri River. And so managing that system, the upper Missouri could be managed or the Yellowstone could be managed. I told you earlier how difficult it is to manage water on this system. Things that could be done out of Fort Peck to try to slow drift to try to maintain drifting free embryos in this free-flowing reach of the river all require changes to Fort Peck, which require changes to the entire management of the system. Highly contentious, very difficult, very, very uh, economically difficult to do. The, the fish require 11 to 14 days, but based on where these impediments are, they only have about three or five days available. So inevitably, they're going to end up in the lake and, and they're going to die. So a lot of the emphasis has been over here on the Yellowstone. Again, Great hydrograph on the Yellowstone. That doesn't require any sort of management or restoration, but there's this problem here with intake weir. Uh, this is what intake looks like. It's not a very impressive dam. It's a really a pile of rocks across the river uh, that provides a little bit of head for the headworks for this irrigation project through here. And this is what it looks like at, at ground level. Not very impressive, and a salmon can get up this, but a pallet surgeon can't or at least the documented movement of pallet surgeon has been very, very small uh, up uh, through this. And so there is a fish passage project that's going on around uh, Intake Dam. It's in process right now. They've gone through the NEPA process. Um, it's being done in collaboration between the Corps and the Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. Service uh, and uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, estimated cost of this is $80 million. Um, it's, it's a bit of a desperate move in the sense that 
If this doesn't work, then all the management actions have to be over here, and that's going to be very, very hard. Um, it's also kind of desperate because there, maintain, there, there remain some very high biological unknowns. There's a few historical observations of fish up this far. The fish will have to go essentially all the way up to the next weir to have sufficient drift distance. So it's really unknown whether the fish are going to uh, move up to the uh, upper uh, Yellowstone and, and spawn sufficiently far upstream. In fact, the places where we've documented spawning in the Yellowstone over the last three years have been at River Mile 5 down here, which only has about a day's worth of drift distance down into the lake. So that'll be an interesting thing uh, as it goes on to see whether that's successful in, in, uh, in, a, in a fairly desperation move to try to uh, maintain that group of 125 uh, pallet sturgeon. In the lower river, um, we can, uh, there, there, there's uh, more things that can be done in terms of restoration. Break it down into two dominant restoration vectors, restoring the, the flow regime, and changing the channel form. What we generally do in terms of both assessing what's, what's happened on the river and, and in design is use computational two-dimensional models to do that uh, so that we can look at that interaction of flow regime as it has a restoration variable and, and channel configuration of the restoration variable in time and space and quantify habitat, model depth velocity habitat and different, uh, different de habitat definitions. What we would like to do is, be, is to take that habitat information and then assess growth, condition, mortality, and survival. That's the biological stuff we haven't been able to do yet. But what we've done instead is define these functional habitats that we think have um, the capacity for biological inference. Um, a little bit of a, of a uh, side note here um, about management of the hydrograph. In 2000, Five, there was an effort to get um, a collaborative group together in the Missouri River to design the spring pulse. The spring pulse of design is a change of the hydrograph in the Missouri River specifically to try to get the palace turgeon to spawn. It's a spawning cue. Well, we don't really know whether that's a limiting factor for the fish right now, but that was what was the thought in 2005. So here's the, uh, this is at uh, just downstream of Gavin's Point Dam. So here's the, the uh, natural hydrograph again shown in, in, uh, in blue here, and here's the regulated one here. There was a uh, drawn out negotiation with stakeholders and the Corps and the service, and this was the design for the naturalized hydrograph. My point here is that changing the flow on the Missouri River is so contentious that, that this was the best that they could do in terms of a mutually acceptable flow pulse uh, on the Missouri River compared to its, its natural flow pulses. And by the way, this was still extremely contentious, especially uh, upsetting to the uh, downstream interests. So instead, there's been a lot of emphasis on channel reconfigurations. A lot of uh, side channel chutes that have been constructed, these very large, trying to replace some of the off-channel habitat. And then there's a lot of within-channel work that's been done to try to increase the, the uh, uh, shallow slow water habitat, increase the top width of the river, moving a lot of dirt around. What's interesting about this has been a lot of physical monitoring, a lot of biological monitoring, but in the end, there is no good biological indication that these have been uh, at all instrumental in helping recover the pallet sturgeon. There has been some uh, response in the native fish community, but if, again, the emphasis is on these particular species and demonstrating uh, the efficacy in terms of those species. Uh, here's a map of those uh, habitat projects on the lower Missouri River. Um, it's uh, pretty uh, pretty up to date. Uh, Gavin's Point Dam here, St. Louis down here, and you can see the number of, of projects. So in the original uh, design uh, of these, the objective was to create habitat that had been, been lost because of the bank stabilization navigation project. And so the design goal was to replace 20 to 30 percent of that aquatic habitat, uh, defined as zero to five foot deep and zero to two feet per second. That was based on knowledge of what was lost historically, and the biological inference that they thought that was probably good for nursery habitat for the pallet sturgeon, but it had never been demonstrated that that was the case. And as time has gone on, they've still not been able to demonstrate that. The biologists I work with, the Fish Wildlife Service, the states are involved in this. There's a lot of change in, in geomorphology, a lot of change in channel configuration, but we haven't seen that fish response. Here's an unrestored reach. Here's one that has a lot of restorations, it's Hamburg Bends, Hamburg, Iowa. Uh, showing constructed side channels, Upper Hamburg and Lower Hamburg. Uh, 
Um, and what we've done recently is we've said, okay, if we're not seeing the response to that zero to five foot, zero to two feet deep, maybe we're just not looking at it ecologically enough. And so we're looking now at um, trying to understand uh, these functional habitats, food producing habitats, foraging habitats, and free, inter free embryo interception habitats. I'm only gonna go into one of these, that's the food producing habitat. Um, that we've defined is less than 0 0.08 meters per second. And we base that on the fact that when those free embryos transition to first feeding, their diet is, consists almost exclusively of coronamid larvae. Uh, coronamid larvae bur burrow into fine, stable sediment. So that has to be something that is a stable area and based on some of the transport criteria, estimated to be about uh, 0 0.08 meters per second. So we're saying that is place that can provide this food source to those young fish. So we take, this is another one of the, the built out habitat areas, Lisbon, Lisbon Jameson area. Uh, we have uh, two dimensional hydraulic models. This is at a, um, this one is actually at a five meter uh, uh, mesh. So it's a pretty, pretty detailed model. And then we use those relationships to model uh, food produ producing acres per mile. Uh, this is discharge, uh, normalized by median discharge on this axis. And what I'm doing here is I'm comparing two restored sites to two channelized sites. The blue site is the Hamburg site. The green site here is the Lisbon site. They both produce a lot of food producing habitats, although it's somewhat different discharges, and that's a story I, I can't really get into. But they produce a lot more of that food producing habitat than the, than the uh, channelized sites do. That's, you know, I, I think a, a, you know, a robust way to go looking at, uh, at uh, the, what, what creates these uh, food producing habitats. And then we can look at the interaction of that with the flow regime, which is the other thing that can be managed on the system. And what's shown here is a box plot of uh, 100 years of daily data showing uh, food producing uh, <coughs> habitat area in acres per mile, comparing channelized to restored for a series of different um, uh, flow regime management uh, actions here. I won't get into the details of this, um, but two things I'll point out. One is that the result of this shows that, in fact, that channel reconfiguration is much more effective in creating habitat than changing the flow regime. Even if we're looking at, this would be the natural flow regime right here. If you look at the medians, uh, and, and this is completely off the table as far as the management action, some of these environmental flow regimes over here create quite a bit more habitat, but much more if they're done with a reconfigured channel. It kind of makes sense to do that. So, you know, a robust way to go looking at what works and what doesn't work for, for management. If you're satisfied with habitat on the y-axis here. And the take-home message, one of the take-home messages here is that stakeholders and a lot of the agencies are not ha happy with habitat. They want to see population response. And that's a difficult thing to do scientifically. So we are left with a situation where, you know, from this analysis, we, we can change flow and we can change form of the lower river semi-independently. Flow is extremely difficult to do. Uh, channel form configura reconfiguration is uh, much, much easier. The objectives over time have gone from more holistic restoration to mm -hmm. very, very specific. And there's more emphasis now on trying to get not just to functional habitats, but to actual population responses. So we're sort of at a crossroads in the science in the Missouri River right now. Um, and that means there's a lot of debate about the science. And the debate takes place in this group, which is called the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee. It's composed of uh, 70 stakeholders, uh, including agencies, tribes, states, NGOs, landowners, representing everything from the agricultural navigation community through Nature Conservancy and American Rivers and Isaac Walton League and all the states and all the tribes. Um, this is the venue, uh, they have quarterly meetings, big ballrooms like this, uh, highly facilitated meetings, usually polite conversations, sometimes not so polite. Um, and it's, it provides a venue for transparency, for you know, knowledge transfer and for the debate of the science. The point here is that many of the stakeholders remain unsatisfied with the state of the science. Um, they question whether any of this restoration should proceed until they're 100% sure that it's going to work. Um, so there is, let's see, what did I do with it? The quote, um, which I've, I've misplaced, but the quote goes something like, um, the stakeholders are unwilling to uh, negotiate until they're 100% sure that there will be an ecological result from this restoration 
that is commensurate with their knowledge that they are going to lose in the process. In other words, their perception is that this restoration has a downside and they're the people who are losing in that process. Missouri River has an independent science advisory panel with eminent scientists on it uh, who, who give us, the scientists, uh, guidance. Um, and they give the members some guidance, but they really haven't stepped in on this question. It's kind of open. You know, where is the science going to go and how good does it need to be to continue with, with restoration? Right now, <coughs> restoration is moving forward, but at a slower pace as they're trying to make more of the stakeholders happy, which may in fact be impossible. So to, to sum all this up, um, these large river systems are, con are contentious. I hope I made that point. They're challenging, they're complex, um, and at times they may appear irrational. I've got many, many stories about how irrational things can be. But they're always, always interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, social, political, legal, economic, and biological context to these large rivers. Um, because there's so many different stakeholders who want to get something out of the river, it implies more of that designer ecosystem concept. You're not going to really turn it back the way it used to be, but there's a sense that it can be naturalized and more people, more stakeholders could maybe get more out of the system than it has right now. Um, the big uh, club here is the Endangered Species Act. That's what's driving all the restoration. And if that goes away, then there will be no restoration at all in the Missouri River. That's one thing I would, I would predict. Common ground in this context is rare. Uh, it might be that there could be some common ground in some ecosystem services. Uh, if restoration projects turn out to have flood, significant flood mitigation effects, for example, that could be common ground. Um, if there's ways that uh, landowners can make money off of restored areas that are next to them, to their land, that could be common ground as well. It hasn't happened so far. But this whole thing sets very high expectations for the science, this, this point that there has to be a demonstrable linkage from here's the restoration that t activity that takes place, you change the hydrograph this much, you change the channel by this much. They want to show what that means in terms of effects on palace sturgeon population. And that's a very difficult thing to do. It's going to probably keep me in business for uh, the rest of my career. So thanks very much for your time. I hope you found this uh, interesting, uh, if somewhat different from uh, some of the work that, uh, that you all do. So thank you. And, and Barbara will tell us if we have time for questions. We do. We have five minutes for questions. So I will try to be as awesome as Bob and running around the room to give you this microphone if you have a question. So Rob, from a, a biological standpoint and trying to show benefits of increased population with all of the I'm thinking about my work in azure streams out in the west, when you have oceanic conditions that affect things, how long, how many samples, how do we, you know, people want to see produce, yep. they want to see fish, how do you have any recommendations on, we can show changes in habitat, but the biological component is uh, going to be a keystone to something. Absolutely. And so there are two uh, major monitoring programs on the Missouri River. One's called the Population Assessment Program that has been, uh, its objective is to get at population trends on a catch per unit effort basis. Um, and there's been, it's been going on for 10 years. Uh, we know that the population has continued to decline. That shows us that. And there is a stocking program going on, so the non-wild fish are increasing, and that the Population Assessment Program tells us that. But it doesn't provide us the survival information we need to do the population models. So one of the things is that the information is being collected, but it may not be quite the right information to apply to the decision-making process. So, yeah. You mentioned the pallet sturgeon population is really quite mobile. Uh, so what's its uh, population health down at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi? A very interesting question. Um, the, we have the same inability to actually census the population down there, so we don't know. Um, survival is assessed through, through recaptures of fish, okay? And from that, we can infer something about the population size. Um, there's a biological opinion that ends at that confluence, but it turns out that because of this drift phenomenon, a lot of the fish that are spawned in the Missouri River through passive drift have to end up in the Mississippi River. So they're actually not a separate population. And one of the unknowns is how much exchange actually takes place. 
So um, we don't know how many fish are there, but we do know that it's part of what's happening on the Missouri River. To extend the question a little bit, I'll take advantage of this to extend the question. There are fish all the way down in the Atchafalaya in the lower uh, Mississippi. That's when the geneticists get involved and get into, into fights. Because um, some people say, well, there's so many pallet surgeon down there, you've met your recovery goals. And then the geneticists say, wait a minute, those aren't pallet sturgeon. And some fisheries biologists say, I go with this geneticist, other goes with the other geneticist. So there's a lot of discussion about what a pallet sturgeon is genetically. And so that makes it difficult to answer, I mean, in addition to inability to census these populations uh, with any precision, the genetics also you know, give us that question of, are we even looking at the same thing in different places? One more question. Anybody? I designed the tables to fail if you fell asleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's got a factor of safety equal to 1.1. 1. 1. <laughs> you had mentioned there isn't um, there's some resistance from stakeholders of uh, habitat recreation. And um, to be honest, I was wondering what some of the, the big arguments are. Yeah, so it's interesting that the, the, the groups that are most resistant to the habitat restoration um, are the ones who really say, you've got to demonstrate that this is working for pallet sturgeon. They're not interested in, in, in holistic, at least they're, they're not using that as a negotiating position right now. Um, turns out there are, there are two prominent lawsuits on the Missouri River right now. One is uh, over 200 plaintiffs from um, uh, northwestern Missouri, um, uh, southeastern Iowa, South Dakota, um, North Dakota, and some in Montana, who are suing the United States of America, not, not the Corps, not the service, they're suing all of us, for um, not doing due diligence in preventing flooding on the Missouri River. And they make several, several points. The Corps of Engineers should have, been, should have done a much better job of controlling the floods through the 90s and the large flood in 2011. They say they didn't do it. And they said they didn't do it because they were putting too much emphasis in managing the river for endangered species. Um, especially the, the amount of water in the system for endangered species. There's actually no technical merit to that, in my opinion, but that's one of the arguments that's being made. Another argument that's made is that the restoration projects that are on the river have increased flood risk. Now, my understanding of physics is that it should be decreasing flood risk because they're actually increasing conveyance um, and decreasing stage, and I, I do think they do that. Um, but their argument is that it's increasing flood risk and it is bolstered by the fact that there were a couple levee failures associated with restoration projects. And those levee failures, you know, flooded and put large splays of sand in onto private land. So there is, a, there is you know, some basis for concerns from that. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, um, the agricultural community is concerned about it. The navigation community is concerned that the flows won't be there um, to uh, provide for floating barges when they when they need them, so those are the, and there's also some of the municipalities are very concerned about water levels, making sure that because one of one of the options of water level management is to decrease flows in the summer to provide more nursery habitat, decrease them to the point where municipal water intakes may not have enough reach and where uh, navigation may be precluded. So, lots lots of contention there. Please join me in thanking Rob one last time.